Um, hello, everybody, and uh, good morning. Good morning to everyone who is also joining us from Facebook. Uh, welcome to our National Dialogue on Multi-Stakeholder Engagement in Time and Action Sri Lanka, organized by Sight and Hast. Um, thank you very much to all of the speakers who have joined us Sorry, my videos are not. Uh, who have joined us ahead of time and who are giving their time to make this possible. Um, so maybe to first get started, I would like to uh, welcome our executive director, Ms. Wachita Vijayanayaka, for some opening remarks. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, a welcome to the stakeholder engagement dialogue on climate action, biodiversity, forestry, and agriculture in Sri Lanka. I warmly welcome all the speakers, especially uh, Dr. Jayatunga, who's the additional secretary to the Minister of Environment, um, and Dr. Punivadana, Dr. Prithviraj, um, Ms. Sandra Satwa Singha, and Ms. Nilmini Rana Singha, who will be joining us as expert speakers today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope to have a dialogue with the participants and everyone on how stakeholder engagement could contribute to scaling up climate action and resilience building um, in the country as well as at international level. Um, I will not take a lot of time. Uh, I will pass the mic again to Senashia, but just want to warmly welcome all of you and just to highlight the purpose of today's discussion. Um, so we look forward to a lively discussion among the experts as well as the participants and also sharing of experiences and knowledge that you've acquired and your experiences on engaging as stakeholders in the process in the next two and a half hours. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vasita. Now I would like to uh, give the screen to uh, Dr. Sunimal Jayatunga, the additional secretary to the Minister of Environment, Dr. Jayatunga. Uh, thank you, Senasia. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, Ms. Vasita Vijayanayaka, Executive Director of uh, Strike and Trust, Dr. Ranjit Punyavardhana, uh, Chairman of National Expert Committee on Climate Change Adaptation, Mr. Andrew Satur Singh, uh, former uh, Conservative General of Forest, and others who are joining this um, uh, meeting. Uh, first of all, uh, let me appreciate Strike and Trust for organizing this event, especially related to multiple stakeholder, multi stakeholder engagement in climate action and giving. Uh, an opportunity for me to inaugurate this um, event. As we all know uh, that uh, Sri Lanka is one of the most vulnerable country in the world in terms of um, climate change adverse impacts. Uh, especially in Sri Lanka, we, we are uh, experiencing prolonged drought situation in the dry zone. And due to uh, uh, monsoon pattern change, and also uh, flash floods and landslide uh, due to intensive rainfall, especially it is affected in our in the wet zone in lowland for flash floods and uh, landslide in uh, central highlands. So also, uh, though it is happening as slow onset, even the sea level rise is also one of uh, major adverse impact for Sri Lanka being an island. So we have a, a very long coastal belt and this coastal belt is highly vulnerable to uh, sea level rise. And also cyclones and small scale tornadoes, hurricanes and also happening, you know, I think you have uh, heard several times. <clears throat> um, that is very small scale um, cyclone, tornado type uh, and hurricane type uh, cyclones is happening in the country. So recognizing this uh, vulnerability to adverse impact of climate change in Sri Lanka, we have uh, conducted um, several uh, vulnerable assessments and we have identified many sectors are uh, highly vulnerable to adverse impact of climate change, especially uh, agriculture, fisheries, livestock, coastal health, biodiversity, tourism, 
and a uh, few other sectors um identifying this vulnerability so we have um prepared our national climate change adaptation strategy in 2010 and based on that uh, we have prepared our national adaptation plan to be implemented uh, from 2016 to 2025 and also in between uh, sri lanka has uh, prepared the national climate change policy addressing vulnerability adaptation mitigation uh, and other most uh, relevant areas related to climate change sri lanka being a national focal point to the united nations framework convention and being the national focal point that ministry of environment especially climate change secretariat has taken several steps to uh, address this adverse impact of climate change as you know that um, in order to address uh, climate change very recently not recently but five years before so there is a, a agreement okay, adopted by all world community that is called uh, paris agreement under the paris agreement um, we have submitted our nationally determined contribution as our national commitment Sri Lanka signed this uh, Paris Agreement on 22nd April in 2016, and also accredited this agreement in uh, on 21st September in 2016, uh, and submitted our nationally determined contributions. Our nationally determined contributions um, consist of four major areas. one is uh, adaptation that is uh, building resilience to meet adverse impact of climate change the other area is uh, mitigation that is reducing greenhouse gas emission in potential sectors in the country especially energy transport industry waste and forestry and also that loss and damage also one of the uh, uh, thematic area or component that we incorporated into our nationally determined contributions because uh, due to uh, climate induced disasters as well as other disasters there are a lot of for oh, huge damage and losses are taken place in order to support for the uh, the UNFCCC process that um, washo international mechanism on loss and damage so we incorporated this uh, this area as one of um, the area that we need to address climate change in the country that loss and damage then the other area is that in order to uh, implement um, climate change related actions related to adaptation mitigation and loss and damage we need means of implementation such as finance uh, technology development and transfer and capacity building during this um, process in fact that uh, conducting vulnerable assessment and also preparing national adaptation plan national strategy for uh climate change and also uh, national climate change policy the the all the relevant stakeholders government non government private sector civil society academia media and all the um stakeholders all the strata of the society have been engaged or involved to come up with very sound uh, action plans and strategies for the country so we submitted the ndcs in 2016 so there is a provision in the um, the cop decision that the paris agreement adopted that is 1 cp 21 again parties are uh, uh, allowed to uh, review their ndcs and submit resubmit updated ndcs by 2020 the utilizing that provision uh, sri lanka started this uh, reviewing and updating on the ndcs what we submitted in 2016 uh, in 
in february uh, last year the all the uh, relevant stakeholders invited government private sector civil society international ngos ngos academia media and all the relevant stakeholders got involved uh, in the process of reviewing and updating our ndcs so this is uh, now in uh, final stage this um, updating process and now at this stage we are finalizing the document editing uh, it to be submitted as a international document so what i wanted to highlight is that uh, during this process all the relevant stakeholders not only government or private sector that civil society also play uh, a major role providing input engaging uh, all the stakeholder consultation process workshops meetings we conducted and also i want to highlight here that uh, i think uh, most of you are aware that under the unfpc there is uh, one of uh, climate finance arm was established in 2014 that is called uh, green climate fund under the green climate fund we have been able to up to now two major full scale projects to be um got the proved and implemented in the country the one is um, i think you have heard about that program to do this project is um, seven year project now almost i think uh, half of that time uh, passed and it is implementing in miyoya yanno and malwatu river basins uh the second project is um, totally focus on the uh, central highland or the watershed that is um, now it is realized and it is to be implemented onward this year so it is in fact uh, um, 39.7 million us dollars and the previous one is 38.1 million us dollars so in this um, project formulation and also the planning and uh, even implementation so the almost all the relevant stakeholders are engaged and uh, they have uh, uh, opportunity and room to engage um, climate actions through this project further there are you know uh, under the global environment facility gif Uh, many projects are going on one project is i think uh, miss nilmini may highlight uh, in her presentation that is uh, managing together that is uh, biodiversity how biodiversity can uh, support for agriculture forestry and tourism sector so it is uh, to be implemented in malwatu river basin there is also um, uh a very large project that uh, many stakeholders are engage in in this project <clears throat> so under the national adaptation plan just i want to highlight that uh, under the uh, national adaptation plan there is a, a provision or there is a, a, a decision and it is itself in the nap to establish some um, civil society forum so civil society has a big role to play in climate actions uh, especially building resilience in most vulnerable sectors such as agriculture forestry biodiversity health tourism coastal and marine so so however that um, is still what i my feeling is the, the there is a big role to play by civil society or the civil society organizations in terms of uh, building resilience to meet the adverse impact of climate change in the country but um, 
still uh, not uh, sufficient contributions uh, what i see but i think from our side also from government side also have to be open that but uh, without um, having uh, any communication uh, with uh, climate change secretariat many uh, civil society organizations are working alone by the, themselves but in order to build resilience uh, i think uh, we need to have a very good uh, uh, cooperation collaboration and relations to be established between government private sector civil society and other uh, relevant stakeholders uh, by the ministry of um, environment and climate change secretary there are many awareness and capacity building programs are conducted very different areas under different projects so we have invited and we have uh, requested to participate all the relevant stakeholders um, including civil society and also uh, in many uh, occasions we have um, identified that some of uh, groups vulnerable most vulnerable communities such as youth women children adults are also very important and they have they are most vulnerable and they have a, a vital role to play uh, in terms of uh, climate actions in the country uh, one more thing i would like to highlight here that um, the migration uh, due to climate induced disasters is also happening in the sri lanka but it is not uh, much highlighted yet especially in uh, uh, prolonged out situations you know that uh, agriculture is the most vulnerable uh, sector in that area and the, the the farmers or the the communities who engage in agriculture they are migrating looking for alternative uh, livelihoods to the urban areas i want to uh, inform you that uh, we are at present uh, conducting an assessment uh, to understand this uh, pattern of migration and though it is seasonal though it is uh, permanent migration that assessment is supported by the international organization on migration so uh, as i highlighted is still uh, there is a gap of uh, engagement of all the uh, stakeholders including civil society in order to address climate change in the country one more thing i would like to highlight here that um, under the national adaptation plan there is a provisions to um, prepare and implement provincial adaptation plans so climate change secretariat being the national focal point to the un privacy we have initiated that developing provincial adaptation plans for uh, nine provinces and also establishment of um, uh, provincial climate institutions set up especially uh, provincial climate cells and provincial climate unit and also provincial uh, climate data portal during the, those process i want to highlight here that as much as possible uh, civil society organizations academia media private sector government national and provincial setup have been engaged uh, what i have to say here that and from the final word is that it is um, growing that uh, engagement of uh, the all relevant stakeholders uh, gradually i hope that uh, this event is also provide uh, an opportunity for uh, other stakeholders other civil society organization also to get engaged in this uh, climate change uh, process in the country there is an, uh, an enormous opportunity for uh, all the relevant stakeholders means that civil society organizations to engage in um, 
climate actions in the country it is open for all uh, if i say some example as you know that we have targets to uh, increase our porous cover i hope mr satru singh will highlight it that so in order to uh, increase tree cover and also porous cover civil society organization can take a, a big role for um, planting trees and conserving uh, ecosystems and also uh, in sri lanka we have uh, a target of being the um, champion in the world in terms of um, conserving and rehabilitation of mangroves so civil society has an opportunity to engage for this uh, target is also so there are uh, many opportunities i hope uh, during this event you will elaborate and identify those opportunities here being the national focal point to the un fcc we are uh, very much uh interested and very much um, expected to support for uh, get engage civil society organization for addressing climate change in the country so having said that um, let me conclude my uh, intervention uh, by thanking all of you especially uh, sri can trust and miss wasita vijayanayaka for organizing this the timely and vital important um event today and giving this opportunity for me to share some of um ideas and views uh, to you and thank you very much for listening to me thank you uh thank you very much dr jatendra before you go there are maybe like a few questions also that uh, if you do if you do have some time uh because i i do realize that you have other appointments uh so but just maybe quickly if you could elaborate a little more on the provincial adaptation plans and uh the status of it you know it's still ongoing and especially in relation to what we are talking today on agriculture forestry and biodiversity how are they included are they focusing on it uh, if you will be able to go into detail about this a bit more yeah uh thank you shinashia um regarding uh provincial adaptation plans we have already initiated that uh, identifying the most vulnerable sectors and also the relevant stakeholders who are responsible for implementing those activities in fact due to this uh, covid-19 situation our process was a little bit uh, drawback but very soon we are expecting to start the uh, process again with uh, provincial uh, setup so in fact uh, during past uh, two consultation in each provinces we invited all the civil society in the province and also private sector in the province and also relevant uh, stakeholders in the province that ministries department provincial as well as national uh, delegated um, set up in the province so um today we are talking most about forestry and biodiversity and agriculture so almost all the provinces identified that agriculture is one of the most vulnerable sector forestry is also one of uh, the sector that can contribute to climate change mitigation especially uh, carbon sequestration or carbon dioxide um, uh, absorption uh, by trees and forests and also biodiversity is uh, one of the most vulnerable uh, sector because of um, prolonged droughts flash floods landslides sea level rise so almost all the adverse impacts are affected for these uh, three sectors so the process i want to uh, inform you that uh, under the green climate fund there is uh, one one of supports one of readiness for developing countries providing 3 million per country uh, national adaptation planning readiness so we have been able to got that 3 million uh, us dollars for the country especially uh, to implement our national adaptation plan including provincial adaptation plans in addition that fao 
He is also supporting for us to build resilience for the provincial setup. So we have already discussed that um, to divide in some, some provinces for the FAO project and some provinces for uh, our NAP readiness uh, project to identify the, the most implementable and attainable uh, climate change actions, especially to build resilience. Some of uh, potential mitigation actions also will be identified in the provinces. So these are uh, pipelines and it is in fact a uh, good opportunity for uh, civil society organizations to engage uh, in this process. If you need further, I, I am here. Sinasha. Uh, thank is, you, Dr. Jayatunga. Uh, so maybe quickly, Dr. Punyavadwara also raised his hand. Dr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Jayatunga, please correct me if I am wrong. I think uh, Western province has already developed the provincial adaptation plan. No? Yes, yes, they had the provincial adaptation plan plan uh, including adaptation and mitigation but it is ended by uh, 2018 uh, yeah so we need to have a separate one now to update it we have update it yeah yeah and uh, maybe just just one final question from my end dr jayatunga on the ongoing ndc review process um about the final version like do we have a timeline on when we plan to submit it to the UNFCCC? Yeah, thank you. In fact, uh, as per the COP decision, the, the, the submission was to be done uh, by end of uh, 2020, but due to COVID situation, so we have get not only us, but uh, many countries has taken that liberty to uh, get extension because that COP26 also was postponed. Uh, so um, now our deadline is, in fact, end of this month. So now we have the um, draft document. Uh, we are uh, preparing it to be submitted to the uh, Cabinet of Ministers. And uh, after uh, receiving the approval of the Cabinet of Ministers, we will submit it to the UNFCCC. Any more you need? Thank you very much, Dr. Jet. Uh, so, so, so far, so far, no, I'm okay. But uh, if you are there for a while, and in case someone has any questions, you can maybe take that up. But thank you very much, Dr. Jayatunga, for giving us your time and uh, your expertise on this. It, we very much appreciate your continuous contribution. Uh, for that next presentation, just if you are logistic. Thank you. Thank you, Senasia. But if you, if any other one has any question, better to ask now because I have to move to the another meeting. Um, does anyone have any questions? You could raise your hand, and we could maybe you could unmute yourself. Mm. Or perhaps not. We could. Oh, sorry, was it there? Unmuted. Yeah, just to um, quickly um, thank you, Dr. Jayatunga, for joining us today. It was very informative. Um, just to have uh, an idea of how resilience building could be taken, like you mentioned, the provincial adaptation plans, and some of the actors here work at the local level, like going to divisional and district levels. Um, so, is there a plan on how the NDCs could be localized? Um, is there like some sort of uh, action that's envisaged once the submission is done because I'm just like trust works on this and some of the others here would also do the same I think yeah yeah thank you Vajita in fact when we go to uh, provinces to uh, prepare the uh, provincial adaptation plan definitely we will take um, national adaptation plan and also NDCs so uh, we will try to um, streamline uh, national actions into a uh, provincial setup because you know that uh, in order to implement uh, resilience building at ground level, we have to go to um, pro provincial and also district levels. So because uh, they know the reality and they, 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 they are facing the 
adverse impacts and they are experiencing it and also uh, the, the the easy way of implementing uh, ground level activities at the ground level by the, those um, provincial uh, institutions including civil societies uh, uh, one thing i would like to uh, request from you if you have in provincial level um, civil society uh, list with you so please provide us then we can invite them for our uh, consultation at uh, provincial setup thank you thank you dr jatung thank you Hoshita and dr jatung does anyone have any other questions for dr jatung this might be your only opportunity to get you have today all right so Okay, it seems like everything's clear. So thank you once again, Dr. Jayatunga. We appreciate you uh, being here today and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very you much. You um, so before we maybe move on to the uh, next uh, speaker, there are uh, a few logistical announcements that I'd like to make. First, there is, if you would check on your chat, there is a link to a Google form that would be a virtual registration sheet for the day. I would kind of like to request everyone to fill that out so we have an understanding of who's here and if we're taking this discussion forward, uh, we will also be able to invite you all. And uh, second, we will be having a quick Mentimeter. I'm just going to uh, drop that on the chat as well. Um, share my screen. Right. Um, I hope you could see my screen. Sorry. Um, OK, um, I think so you should be able to see my first question on how would you be able to best describe your organization. So um, so to access this and to also those joining us on Facebook, log on to menti.com and use the code 95495713. Um, it used to be much shorter than that before. Anyways, so uh, log on to menti.com and please use the code. The, the code is also on the chat. And uh, just to get an understanding of which organizations that you're joining us from. So we have the options of CSO, government organization, private organization, academia, and if uh, and other if you don't identify with any of them. So currently we have three from CSOs, one academia, uh, sorry, one other. Um, everyone, if there's anyone also joining us from Facebook, <coughs> you could also take part in uh, the Menti. So log on to menti.com and use the code 95495713. Um, keep it on for about 30 seconds more. So we have six from CSOs, one from other. We do have 34 participants on the call, so. Uh, <laughs> so uh, just let everyone know again, uh, you could log on to menti.com and use the code 95495713. Right, so um, we'll maybe move on to the next. Okay, so oh, we have one private organization. Thank you for joining us. And we'll just move on to the next uh, question. Two from private organizations, right? Um, yeah, uh, what area of work uh, do you most identify with? So we have forestry, agriculture, biodiversity, and those are the three areas that we'll be discussing today. And uh, this would also be helpful, uh, which we will come to a bit later when we have our breakout groups. So uh, currently we don't get your details, but we will come to that a bit later. So, okay, so you have six from agriculture, two from forestry, one from biodiversity. Okay, okay, we have two from biodiversity. Seven from agriculture. Okay, this is this is very good. All right. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, taking part in our little interactive session. And also, maybe just to uh, 
let you know that uh, we have a registration form that has been said on the chat. I'll also we drop the link again today. Um, sorry, drop the link again shortly. Uh, this is just to get an understanding of who's on the call and um, who will be interested in when we have to take this conversation forward. So, okay, now moving on uh, with a uh, lineup of speakers. Next up, we have Ms. Anil Sasur Singh. He's a director here at Like and Trust, and he serves as the director of ecosystems and conservation. Uh, Ms. Sasur Singh. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, let me share my presentation first. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Can you see it? Yes, Mr. Yes, it looks good. Right. Um, I'm going to talk about the forestry, climate change, and stakeholder engagement. Uh, let me start uh, with. Uh, sorry. Some problem. Yeah. Uh, let me start with uh, the forests, uh, the benefits of the forests and support to the people. Like uh, this is the really updated information I collected from a UCN. So globally, 1.6 million, nearly 25% of the total population of the world rely on forests for their livelihoods or any other type of uh, living. And uh, if you calculate the value of the services they produce, services, goods and services, especially the ecosystem services such as clean water and healthy soils. Um, it's been estimated like uh, $1.75 billion to $100 billion per year. Uh, and uh, the forests are home from the biodiversity point of view. Forests are home for the 80% of the total terrestrial biodiversity. So with that, uh, when, I, when we look at the interrelation between forest and climate change. As we all know, forest has a dual role like uh, the sink and source. So here, uh, looking at the sink, forest help stabilize the climate in many different ways, like regulate direct ways as well as indirect ways, like by regulating ecosystems, protecting biodiversity, and even supporting livelihoods in, indirectly and various other things. Now. For example, they say to maximize the climate benefit of forests, we must keep more forest landscapes intact and manage them more sustainably to restore and resort, uh, restore more landscapes uh, which we have lost. And uh, sorry, let me go back. And uh, I mean, halting the loss or the, uh, halting the degradation and deforestation. It has the potential to contribute over one third of the total climate change mitigation uh, by uh, required by 2030, according to the scientists. And also, if we look at the bond challenge, uh, which is aiming at restoration of 350 million hectares. So, uh, so once this is completed, uh, the scientists believe that 1.7 gigatons uh, of carbon dioxide equivalent are being annually restored by these uh, forests. So this is just to give you the connection between forests and the climate change and also the importance of forests for our day-to-day -day life. Sorry. And uh, now these are just, I think everybody, everyone of you are aware about this, but of course, just to show you the uh, forest, because uh, since our topic today is based on forestry, agriculture and biodiversity and the other land uses now, uh, the greenhouse, percentage of greenhouse gases uh, pro produced by agriculture, forestry and other land uses is uh, estimated like 24%. Uh, and forestry itself, uh, due to deforestation and degradation is something from developing countries contributes to about uh, 10 to 12 percent of uh, the total. And uh, coming to the Sri Lankan condition, we, we are rich with different ecosystems and uh, high biodiversity. So you get various types of ecosystems within this small country from uh, high canopy uh, 
complicated structures in the wedge zone to the simple structures two story type of uh, uh, comp uh, ex um, I mean, the structures in the dry zone and uh, even in the arid zone very small very simple structures like but of course when you consider the biodiversity we have the high biodiversity so that is why you want Sri Lanka is considered as one of the hotspots, uh, one of the hotspots in the world. And uh, at the same time, as you all know, uh, the deforestation and degradation is happening continuously. Now, this is the study conducted by the, a team of team from the University of Colombo to help the UN Red Program to identify uh, the drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. Now these uh, arrows pointing to the uh, the map indicates and the uh, la, um, the size of the arrow uh, indicates the magnitude of the problem. Now, for example, in this case, uh, right now the infrastructure de development, uh, new infrastructure development, happen to be the most uh, uh, big impact on the deforestation. Likewise, even uh, the agriculture ventures. Uh, encroachments and then uh, land, I mean, the changes in the land policy are also affecting uh, the forest cover in the country. So, uh, just to looking at the overview, the current uh, situation, uh, we all know this is the 32. I mean, Sri Lanka is one of the global biodiversity hotspots I mentioned, and the existing forest cover is right now is 29.2 according to the recently developed forest cover map, and the government has pledged to increase it up to 32 percent by 2030. It's uh, even uh, in uh, NDC and various other pledges are there, and then uh, right now the ministry. And the forestry is under forest and wildlife subsectors are coming under the Ministry of Forest and Wildlife Conservation established in 9th August 2020, the new ministry. And its mission is to uh, nurture the biodiversity through conservation and wildlife and forest resources to give leadership to make policies on in-situ flora conservation and in-situ and ex-situ conservation of fauna. And thirdly, for the promotion of sustainable timber industry and fourth one to coordination and steering of leading institution uh, for the implementation. Like uh, we have two departments, forest department and wildlife department uh, who are managing uh, this forest, but at the same time, there's a, so this uh, structure shows you how it works, like the Ministry of Wildlife, this is the cabinet ministry. And in addition to that, there's a state ministry and under these two ministries, we get Forest Department, Department of Wildlife Conservation, State Timber Operation, and Department of National Zoological Gardens. And uh, policy framework. Now, uh, we have both uh, direct relevant policies as well as indirect relevant policies. Now, if you take the uh, direct relevant policies, we have the Forest Sector Master Plan. Uh, from 1995 to 2020, and national forest policy established on 1994, the national wildlife policy, national right plus investment framework and action plan, which we called NRIPA, uh, which is uh, looking at 2018 to 22 area, but unfortunately, so far we have not been able to implement this. And uh, national biodiversity strategic action plan and draft national policy on conservation and management of wildlife funds in Sri Lanka draft is available in, since 2019. In addition to that, we have a number of uh, I mean, related policies and uh, even like the, the watershed management, uh, things like impact of climate change, which are really related to land use planning, security areas related and have impacts on the forestry sector in Sri Lanka. And uh, if you look at the current key issues in this sector, the major issues I'm going to just uh, share with you. One is the non-integrated planning and lack of interlinkages between different policies, sectors, and institutions, because this has been led to 
the i mean the, the loss of uh, of forest cover in various ways and and disconnect between economic development and environmental sustainability and lack of sufficient financial resources allocated for forestry and wild life and both departments are suffering from that and most of the cases they have to depend on external funding coming from uh, the donor agencies and even the banks and lack of effective and technical technological investment and interventions in forestry and wild life is almost the same even the monitoring is not happening properly so that is uh, one uh, cause we have identified and finally the increasing demand for wood and wood product this is again uh, i mean uh, one of the big problem facing and the high demand and the price increase in timber products and wood products which uh, led the rural community to go to the forest and uh, encroach um, i mean the fell trees legal and <clears throat> looking at the climate change the uh, subject today or the theme today um, the impact on of climate change related to forestry is i mean as we all know this sri lanka is highlighted through the global climate as uh, dr uh, mentioned earlier uh, uh, sri lanka is one of the uh, top most affected countries from 2018 to 20, 2020 and also sri lanka i mean if you look at the post disaster needs assessment uh, it was found that sri lanka inadequate early warning system in place highlight in the inadequate sees of community preparedness and linkages between forest and wildlife uh, and climate change impacts are not adequately acknowledged or explored through institutional coordination practices so this is a uh, really important from the forest and wildlife sector Uh, for us to address in our future okay so uh then what next then we have to talk we have we know what is happening in the forest sector and uh, the scenarios which are related to the uh, climate change and then what are to be uh, proposed now again i mean as you all know there are two options like the mitigation and the adaptation and a country like sri lanka uh, the most uh, this thing is the adapt we have to look at the adaptation options first so we talk about there uh, the solutions available uh, to introduce agroforestry systems and then soil and water conservation practices use of cover crops then promotion of home, home guards and also promote trees outside forest protection and rest protection and restoration of mangroves and also the re restoration of vegetation covers so these are some of the examples i selected uh, from uh, the ongoing uh, activities in here in sri lanka uh, which could be categorized under ecosystem based adaptation interventions uh, to address the climate change and uh, so you know i mean most most of you are aware about what uh, these actions are the agroforestry or bay of farming that can work for everyone providing human needs while benefiting all forms of life which includes a, it's a sort of a solution for the biodiversity loss as well as increase uh, species diversity within a farming system and also improving the soil fertility as well as uh, the ecosystem services and uh, even for the watersheds this is the ideal system uh, so this is the one option we have for the ecosystem based adaptation to address climate change which is again uh, related to the forestry and then uh, trees outside forest and home guards the forest department as well as the project i work uh, we promote this uh, trees outside forest as well as uh, the home gardens because home gardens produce lots of uh, uh, large sort of considerable percentage of timber uh, requirement in sri lanka and uh, mangrove even dr jaitunga mentioned sri lanka is a pioneer in champion in mangrove conservation so uh, so we do promote the project as well as the departments to both departments promote uh, mangrove conservation by um, 
producing mango seedlings as well as uh, planting them in suitable lands, which uh, we consider as uh, the mangrove restoration. So this is uh, again uh, there is other restoration, normal restoration practices happening in uh, one research plot in Pantana, uh, planted uh, in between pine plantations. It takes time. Like now, the plant planting was started in 2004 and 5, and then right now in 2009. So the trees have grown up to that level. So it's sort of a result of a well planned research. Now. Uh, the results are promising and even giving good uh, uh, opportunities for the uh, current foresters to follow the same type of uh, species selection and the land preparation techniques, even with the nursery techniques, which need uh, methodically and scientifically followed to get uh, successful results. And this is another uh, site happening in Kalutara district, Diyakotakanda. Badura India Restoration Trial uh, conducted by Wildlife and Nature Protection Society of Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm coming to the uh, stakeholder engagement because, because this is this is a really, really interesting topic. And uh, I mean, uh, now when we talk about the forest restoration or the reforestation or any other forest related activity, I mean, we talk about the importance of uh, stakeholder consultations. And it is there, but my uh, feeling is, my personal thinking is it's not up to the level we expect or the, uh, up to the required level. So the major problems now uh, is the lack of proper mechanism to get uh, the uh, stakeholders, especially the rural communities in forest practices, because uh, when, the, when, when you look at the forest policy, it takes about uh, the stakeholder engagement. And But when we, we go to the reg, rules and regulations and the forest ordinance, there's no mechanism to uh, share the benefits with stakeholders. I mean, the legal, I'm talking about the legal sharing, but of course, informally, uh, the department um, has mechanism, developed mechanism, but of course, when it comes to the legal mechanisms and then the le legislators uh, ask about uh, the benefit sharing at the courts, I mean, there's no answer to be given. So this is something because it's stated in the policy, but of course not gone into the practical level. And then uh, even the, with the private sector, the same uh, issue is there. But of course, even with the private sector, I mean, there are lots of things happening as Dr. Jatunga mentioned, but uh, we, I hope we need uh, really to look at these issues and try to uh, solve these problems. And again, the communication, I mean, the, there should be a better communication uh, with uh, different stakeholders, but it is also weak to my knowledge because communication, I suppose, uh, play a very good role in, uh, I mean, having uh, stakeholders uh, link with each other. So this, uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, the issues uh, with uh, stakeholder uh, participation, what they have seen and uh, noticed in the uh, forest sector. And uh, my two uh, final slides look at the implication of COVID-19 situation in forestry sector as well as uh, the climate, it's related to the climate change because this uh, I uh, got from, borrowed from the World Bank because they have uh, started a program called uh, Build Back Better. This is not a new uh, concept, but of course, they, they have utilized this uh, 3B uh, concept to look at the post-COVID situation in uh, uh, they, uh, they are, uh, I mean, funded countries. And looking at the Sri Lanka, they talk about uh, the jobs and economic transformation and the climate change, gender and development, fragility, conflict and violence and governance and institutions. Now, especially even they look at the cross-cutting themes like digital development, investing in human capital, disability in, in inclusion, as well as the sustainability. Because I mean, right now from last year onwards, now we are, I mean, we are fun working within this COVID-19 situation. So we have to consider that too. Uh, we have to consider that too for our uh, ongoing activities. So, 
So with this, uh, if we specifically look at the climate change, um, has compounded the impacts of climate change and demonstrated urgent need to strengthen the preparedness and boost resilience to future shocks. The pandemic's massive economic and social costs have demonstrated the importance of protecting natural ecosystems and strengthening crisis preparedness in order to minimize catastrophic outcomes from shocks. So they talk about uh, the community-based landscape management and also watershed management and ecosystem restoration and sustainable management of forest and marine resources because uh, uh, as selected some interventions which are need to create large number of jobs and especially uh, through small and medium-sized enterprises because um, I mean the, con the lots of countries they have to rethink and uh, re redesign their programs. Um, uh, within this uh, called uh, COVID situation. So this is uh, even applicable to the forestry sector as well as uh, the climate change. So this is uh, the final message I wanted to share with you. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sathar Singh. Um, now uh, we move on. To also, just a quick reminder, as earlier, kindly do fill out the registration form. The link is in the chat. Uh, that would be really great if you could do that. Um, now we move on to Dr. Prithvi Raj Fernando. He is the chairman for the Center for Conservation and Research. Um, Dr. Prithvi Raj. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, um, when you talk about uh, climate change, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, will you be sharing your screen? Uh... Yeah, I will, I will go on to the presentation a little bit uh, into, into my sure. uh, talk. Okay, okay, so when you talk about uh, climate change, um, I guess everybody, what we are really interested in is in climate change mitigation. Now, I think you could think of climate change mitigation in two uh, very uh, different ways. One is to mitigate the climate change itself, that is to try and reduce the climate change. So basically things like tree planting, uh, decreasing greenhouse gas production, such things uh, will hopefully reduce the amount of climate change that is caused by uh, things like the greenhouse gases. Also, it might uh, have some local effects. Now, for a country like Sri Lanka, uh, we are a very small player in the causation of climate change. So I think our main concern should be the mitigation of the impact of climate change on our country. Now, I would say, or I would argue that the main impact of climate change for us is actually on agriculture because the climate change causes unpredictability in rainfall and rainfall patterns. So agriculture, especially agriculture that is based on uh, rainfall is extremely susceptible then to climate change. So we have seen in the past few years that crops have failed, that the production has decreased and a lot of such impacts. But then the question is, what is our response to that? It seems like the main response to this is to increase the area of agriculture and to uh, have more people do agriculture. Now, is the, I, I don't think this is a very scientific approach to the problem because by increasing agriculture, you're putting more people, more people are going to be going reliant on agriculture for their livelihoods. So you are actually putting more people at risk. You are cutting down more forest. You have to, if you are to increase the area of agriculture, 
So that is going to have probably other local impacts uh, which are related to climate change. You're also going to have more and more human wildlife conflict. So if you take human wildlife conflict, I think recently there was some uh, news articles where uh, there was a committee which actually recommended uh, the main recommendations were things like translocation and sterilization of animals uh, to address human wildlife conflict. There have been news reports that uh, every person who, who can cultivate one acre of land can um, have a gun to prevent conflict. So all through this, I think starting at the level of uh, overall response to climate change, to looking at even a small segment of human wildlife conflict or particularly human elephant conflict. I think there is a lack of scientific, scientific analysis of the issues and the, uh, the implementation of appropriate uh, responses and monitoring those responses and using adaptive management to see what works and what doesn't and to change our responses accordingly. So I think this is a major issue that we have in our country, that a lot of the management is ad hoc or based on beliefs and traditions rather than actual scientific thinking. So I think this is exemplified by the human elephant conflict. So I will take a little part of that as an example of what I am talking about. So let's go to share screen now. Okay, so if you look at human elephant conflict, currently Sri Lanka has the highest level of human elephant conflict in the world. And our response to mitigating the conflict has been based on recommendations that were made in 1959, which is a very long time ago. And since then for more than 50 years, we have tried to limit elephants to the protected areas here colored in green, which were to be connected by these blue colored corridors, which were the recommendations made in 1959. But with time, we ended up trying to limit all the elephants in Sri Lanka to the protected areas under the wildlife department. Now this effort has completely failed because if you look at where elephants are today, elephants are present in 62% of Sri Lanka. This is a survey that is done based on a 25 square kilometer grid. This is a, one of these small scales is a 25 square kilometer grid. So if you look at Sri Lanka on a 25 square kilometer grid scale, the dark green areas are where there are no resident people. That is only 18% of Sri Lanka. So on a grid of this scale, there are people resident in 82% of Sri Lanka. The red areas, the red grids are ones that there are no elephants today. So it's the entire zone of the country, the hill country, uh, the Jaffna Peninsula and some of the highly developed uh, irrigation systems in the dry zone of the country. But the rest of the country, there are elephants. Now, if you look at, this is a map of the human elephant conflict based on divisional secretariat divisions. So wherever there are elephants and people living together, there is human elephant conflict. So this is after practically 60 plus years of trying to limit elephants to that 18% of the country where there are no people. Now in 2014, we took half a step forward from that and the wildlife department came up with a plan 
to limit elephants now instead of only the wildlife department areas the wildlife department areas and forest department areas which were linked like this so this is again pretty similar to what was recommended in 1959 but the problem is and this is what we have been trying to do since 2014 so today it is 2021 six years have passed and in the meantime human elephant conflict has increased tremendously the problem with this plan is if we actually look at superimpose that with where the elephants uh, elephants have to be removed from half the area that they are in today so this is after 6 years of trying to do that that has completely failed in addition to the red colored areas of that actually have resident people so how is this going to mitigate the human elephant conflict even if it could be achieved so this is where i say there is very little scientific thinking and analysis in formulation of mitigation plans now going a step further down to specific activities currently the only effective measure that prevents elephant death. and we have constructed more than 4500 kilometers of electric fencing in sri lanka through the wildlife department but the problem is conflict is continuing to increase tremendously so does that mean even fences don't work if you look at these fences i would say 80 to 90% of these fences have forest on both sides and elephants on both sides perhaps 60% of these fences are between wildlife and forest department areas so this is again we make a policy to put up fences to mitigate it but then we don't really look we don't analyze where we are putting the fences we don't go and look whether they are successful or not because doing that activity has become an end in itself so this is i think where we need to change so another example in the northwest this is the tabo fence which is linked to vilpattu this is the um kalle pallakale uh, fence that extends up to the siembalanga mo tank and rasweer now this is the elephants are the red lines are the electric fences that have been put up now the elephants are supposed to be inside these fences but if you look at where the elephants are this is radio tracking data of a number of groups and males it has absolutely no relation to where these fences are this is in the south this is the lunugamera national park which is contiguous with the ala national park these are electric fences and these are three herds which have collars on them so there are this represents about 150 elephants they cannot even go into the park because of these fences because these are not forest department areas but there is not no barrier between these elephants and the developed areas around them so clearly i mean this is very elementary if you do something you need to look at the impact of that and if it is not working you need to change that but we seem to be extremely reluctant to do that in elephants most of the conflict is due to males not herds herds are composed of females and young ones males adult males are single and lot of the conflict incidents the majority are due to these adult males now these yellow dots are is data from adult male that is collared in the same area so he goes in and out of this fence as if it wasn't there so we mainly build these fences to mitigate conflict not mainly entirely and that is mainly addressing the problem with adult males and they have very very little impact on the problems caused by these adult males now if you look at if you put up fences inside the forest a lot of the time the wildlife department areas are interior then you get forest department areas and these fences are in between 
Now, elephants have large home ranges. So in many cases, you are dividing these home ranges and marooning some of the elephants in the forest department area. Now, when you do that, they lose part of the home range. So they have to either stay here and die or break the fence and go back to their former range, or they need to go into new areas to find new resources to survive. So most likely they will go into developed areas. So such fences inside forest actually increase the conflict, not mitigate it. Then if you ask why are we building fences, it is entirely to protect people, their crops, their property. So if you want protection of something, shouldn't the method of protection be relevant to where protection is needed? So if we want to protect developed areas, if we want to protect people, their crops and property, shouldn't the fences be where the development is? So, the, so these are, uh, when, you, when you think about it, this is absolutely elementary thing. This is not rocket science. This is common sense. So if we, we can use fences to safeguard it and number of uh, currently there are about 50 uh, villages which have been protected like this so we can use fences in a more sensible way which have problems the people build the fences they decide where the fences go and they, and they maintain the fences so this kind of approach has been much more successful similarly to protect paddy fields uh, seasonal agriculture the people who do those cultivate those areas can build a simple fence that is put up when they cultivate and then they it's on the boundary of the cultivated area only and they put it up in a day or two and then they cultivate and once the cultivation is finished they roll it up and take it back home so there are ways that you can use methods such as electric fences in a sensible logical scientific way. Now, also the human elephant conflict mixed claim in Sri Lanka is considered to be almost the sole responsibility of the wildlife department. And we have clearly seen that the wildlife department cannot prevent these damages from elephants and other wild animals. So then you have to ask the question, who are the correct, appropriate stakeholders in mitigating the conflict. Clearly, if I have a problem in crop loss due to wild animals, then I should play a major role in preventing that crop loss. And many of the farmers maybe cannot afford things like electric fences they may not have the technical know-how to do these things. So then they need to be helped. Now the question is who should help them? We have in Sri Lanka, we have I think more than 1.4 million government servants and the majority of the government, uh, government servants, their responsibility is the welfare and development of the people. So agencies such as the division of secretariats, agrarian services, irrigation department, Mahavali authority, who actually do this agricultural development, have to take the responsibility to help the people protect themselves. So unless we have a paradigm change like this in how we weave uh, human elephant conflict, human wildlife conflict, and we take a scientific approach to its mitigation, I think we will not be able to address these issues at all. There may be hopefully a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, end of last year, a committee was appointed to develop a national action plan for the mitigation of human elephant conflict based on the policy that was developed in 2006. And so currently there is a national action plan which has been developed and submitted to the government. So, which is based on the principles that I mentioned at the beginning and a scientific approach. So if such things are implemented, I think we will be able to uh, manage this problem. 
So yeah, so um, I will stop there. And I suppose if there are any questions, we can uh, answer, try to answer the some of, some question. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fernando. Um, now to speak a bit on uh, the biodiversity sector in Sri Lanka, I would like to invite Ms. Nelmini Rana Senka. She's the Assistant Director to the Biodiversity Secretary of Sri Lanka of the Ministry of Environment. Ms. Rana Senka. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting Biodiversity Division. Let me share my screen. Okay. You can see your screen, Ms. Rana Senka. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about linkage biodiversity for climate action. I hope uh, you can hear me. And uh, as all of us well aware, uh, Sri Lanka is a biodiversity hotspot, how we consider. Uh, and Sri Lanka's West, West Zone is one of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots. And we can see the endemicity, biodiversity endemicity of the country, flowering plants, butterflies, birds, mammals, dragonflies, freshwater fishes, so on. We have very high endemic species. And here I have shown you some critically endangered endemic fauna uh, because Sri, um, biodiversity division of the Ministry of Environment we are handling the national red list uh, for faunal uh, to assess the threatened status of faunal and floral species. So we have identified a lot of uh, threatened species we get uh, in the country. And by as biodiversity division under the Ministry of Environment, uh, we are the focal point for the UNCBD convention, that is United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, was entered into force in 1993 for the parties of UNCBD and Sri Lanka has ratified the convention in 1994. Uh, so we are, Ministry of Environment is the focal point for the convention of biodiversity and uh, we are operational focal point. Uh, then, under this convention, the three objectives we are trying to achieve. The first one is conservation of biological diversity. And the second one is sustainable use of its components and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources. So conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and the equitable sharing of the benefits arising from it uh, will support for the sustainable development and human well-being of the country. But scientific evidence shown that climate change is a challenging issue and for the realization of this uh, sustainable development goals, what we are really expecting from the biodiversity. So we have understood that climate change is rapidly increasing and stress on ecosystem and uh, for the habitats are very high and uh, biodiversity loss, conservation, biodiversity loss, con conversion or exploitation, spread of invasive alien species and pollution aspects are uh, increasing the impacts of climate change what we are facing today. So climate related threats under biodiversity we have identified as flash floods, drought, sea level rise, landslides, uh, high intensity of rain, fall, spread of invasive species, soil plot intrusion likewise. And under vulnerability, 
we saw that aquatic freshwater habitats and wetlands, mangroves, especially coral reefs, ecosystems, and cloud forests are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Montane species and endemic species have been identified as being particularly vulnerable because of narrow geographic and climatic ranges, limited disposal opportunities, and the degree of other pressure. Then we, we, we just see what are the services what we are getting from our biodiversity. Ecosystem provide a wide range of provisioning, especially for food and fiber, regulate, regulating uh, climate and cultural values, especially recreational and aesthetic values, uh, supporting services such as soil formation services, and for medic medicinal values, livelihood and nutrition, food, sick, and a lot of uh, natural values we get from biodiversity. While ecosystems are generally more carbon dense and biologically more diverse in their natural state, the de degradation of many ecosystems is significantly reducing their carbon storage and sequestration capacity. So th this will lead to increase in emission of greenhouse gases and loss of biodiversity at the genetic level as well as the species level and ecosystem level. So conserving natural, terrestrial, freshwater and marine ecosystems and restoring degraded ecosystems, including their genetic and species diversity along with that is essential for the overall goals of uh, climate to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So that, that's what we uh, we are adhere to UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention, because ecosystems play a key role in global carbon cycle and adapting to climate change. In a nutshell, we can say about 2,500 giga on carbon is stored in terrestrial ecosystems and additional 38,000 gigaton carbon is stored in the ocean. So ocean ecosystems are much more valuable as terrestrial ecosystems. So conservation and management strategies that the main and risk main component to restore biodiversity and it is expected to reduce some of the negative impact from climate change. However, there are rates and magnitude of climate change for which natural adaptation will be, become increasingly difficult. Then, what are the ecosystem-based adaptation uses, biodiversity and ecosystem services right now we have? So coastal defense through the maintenance and restoration of mangroves and other coastal wetlands to reduce coastal flooding and coastal erosion. So mangrove will play a very good role as a coastal defense. Sustainable management of upland wetlands and floodplains for maintenance of water flow and quality. Conservation and restoration of forest to stabilize to stabilize land slopes and regulate water flows. Establishment of drivers agroforestry systems to cope with increased risk from change climatic conditions. And then conservation of agrobiodiversity can provide specific gene pools for crop and livestock adaptation to climate change. Also, protected areas are primary designated for the purpose of biodiversity conservation. They have additional value in storing and sequestration of carbon. So protected areas are vital in this role. To, re 
then we can discuss to reduce the negative impact of climate change on biodiversity we recommend what are the uh, recommendations so ensuring climate change adaptation activities are integrated across as many sectors ministries as possible while avoiding conflicting targets so in in this aspect ministry ministry of environment and wildlife department forest department and all the other agencies we have a uh, very uh, vital role to play and incorporating climate change predictions and vulnerability assessments into national land local protected area policy and land use management policy so policy level decisions we need to implement and then creating natural resource policies that address the interconnected impacts of climate change across separate ministries so when we are once we are taking decisions we have to incorporate all these uh, decisions and actions to the other ministries action plans to ensure that as biodiversity division we have prepared national biodiversity strategic action plan and several actions we have identified under biodiversity strategic action plan to implement across the country so but national biodiversity strategic action plan we have prepared on the the cop uh, decision 10 and ministry agreed to develop with this uh, national biodiversity strategic action plan in line with the it targets so government and non governmental agencies private sector public bodies as well as the national biodiversity expert committee serve their contribution to the preparation of nbsap earlier now we are in the implementing stage of this nbsap and that has 12 national targets which in line with the global ig targets first one is system we, we under that what we have pledged to have a system established and ongoing for inventory inventory is species inventory what we call we, now we are having a program of updating national red list sri lanka fauna and flora so under that we are identifying what are the threatened status of the species in the country so we can assess the biodiversity using that uh, while preparing action plans as well as recovery plans for the threatened species habitat loss degradation and fragmentation are significantly reduced then protected network is made representative of all critical ecosystems and species managed effectively the loss of species is significantly reduced that's what we are expecting the valuation of biodiversity is mainstreaming mechanisms are established to ensure the sustainable use of biodiversity and the other thing traditional sustainable users and traditional practices to promote biodiversity we can utilize and establish sustainable agriculture practices are promoted and established genetic diversity is much important and the genetic diversity of crop file relatives cultivated species and livestock are conserved mechanism for equitable sharing of benefits arising from biodiversity is established and implemented the capacity of ecosystems to deliver goods and services and provide protection from hazards is enhanced and last one biosafety is ensured to achieve these targets again we have we all of us aware like united nations framework convention sri lanka we had submitted ndcs that is nationally determined contributions 
once we have submitted national determined contributions under biodiversity sector we have identified five major uh, objectives the first one is in sri lanka we need to restore degrade degraded areas inside and outside the protected area network then the other ndc is determined contribution is an increased connectivity through corridors landscape matrix improvement and management then identify biodiversity hotspot in sri lanka and upgrade them so identifying what are the main critical areas by high value of biodiversity areas and protecting and update upgrade updating them promote traditional methods of biodiversity conservation for increased resilience in agroecosystems then fifth one implement community driven conservation projects and programs so that is one which is linked to today's uh, main focus that is linkage between community participation how we can get the participation from the community to implement these activities and also establish and implement ex situ conservation programs while doing ex situ conservation first we are always giving priority uh, for the in situ conservation but ex situ conservation is much important when we have to recover threatened species and be, as a example what we are right now carrying out mangrove restoration programs with the participation of community sri lanka officially announced the willingness to be the champion of the commonwealth blue charter on mangrove restoration and livelihoods so once we have pledged this uh, uh, activity to be the champion in mangrove restoration and livelihood action sri lanka has to demonstrate successful practices in science based restoration of mangroves so we have started this program and while generating benefits to the local community getting the support and uh, collaboration with the community uh, we have to develop effective legal and institutional framework for mangrove conservation therefore we first we had a dedicated national policy on conservation and sustainable use of mangrove ecosystem we have developed with the participation of a lot of stakeholders and mangrove expert group then approximately 450 hectares and 3, 235 hectares of degraded habitats were restored with mangrove by the forest department in uh, 2019 to 2020 then while restoring mangroves we have to have a technical guideline so technical guidelines for mangroves expansion and restoration uh, were prepared and also sustainable utilization of mangroves in sri lanka uh, in line with provisions of national policy have been prepared approximately we can say total 17000 hectares of mangrove forest were gazetted under forest ordinance as conservation forest and reserve forest in uh, year 2019 and 2020 we can say total number of uh, 883 hectares of mangrove forest were gazetted under forest ordinance different stakeholders were incorporated while conducting all those implementing activities under the ground level including ngo cbos and private sector organizations with government stakeholders uh, to tree plant programs with the biodiversity secretariat and the forest department so these are some of the photos uh, how we have done this in reality and also while we are conducting these programs and implementing nbsap uh, 
uh, in line with CBD convention, always we expect we have barriers and challenges for effective conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The first one is policy and legal. So existing policies needs to strengthen to achieve integrated uh, planning to mitigate the adverse impacts of land use changes. So, and to improve the coordination among ministries. The second one we have observed, institutional, strengthening capacity of the officers to carry out mandated duties and scientific restoration programs need is uh, an application of new tools and models for the conservation identification of uh, these areas. Then the um, then in a Liquacy of platform of system for multiple agencies operating in the conservation sector, joint project implement and common monitoring to conserve all these uh, programs. The yeah, last one is we always face insufficient financial allocations for biodiversity sector implementation activities. So that's what. Um, I need to explain in my presentation as well as Dr. Jayatunga uh, mentioned that we are, we are having a managing together project uh, in uh, near future. Managing briefly, I will explain. This is going to be uh, uh, implementing the ground level, integrating community centered ecosystem based approaches into forestry, agriculture and tourism sectors. All three sectors, forestry sector, agriculture sector and tourism sector will have a coordination in implementing good practices in ground level. Basically, this project will be happening in uh, trial three trial landscapes in uh, uh, Anuradhapura, Mena and Vaunia districts, two landscapes uh, uh, ground landscapes and the other one is seascape. So integrating all these activities into uh, ground level with the community support and in improving their livelihood is expected by this project. This project has funded by uh, Global Environmental Facility and Ministry of Environment is going to be implement this project with IUCN. So in that, we, we are hoping to take the activities really to ground level to have much to implement best practices in uh, three sectors, the forestry, agriculture and tourism. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramasinghe, for that uh, very detailed presentation and for sharing your time with us today. I would uh, now like to move on to uh, some insight from the agriculture sector, and I would like to invite Dr. BVR Kunivartana. He's a senior technical expert here at Slyke and Trust. I believe Chalani is sharing uh, the presentation. Just take it down. Dr. Kunivartana. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear okay. you. Um, and and your, your presentation is. You can put the slide. Up. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, I think. Good morning to all of you. And I think Dr. Jatung is not there right now, but uh, our former Consultant General of Forest, Mr. Anuradha Singer, and I show our colleague, uh, Professor Tisikut Pala, and all my colleagues in the SLICAN and other participants. Uh, uh, my task is to talk about the impact of climate change on agriculture, uh, but agriculture and water sector go in, goes hand in hand. Therefore, I will briefly touch upon uh, about the water sector as well. And then uh, uh, I will uh, move on to the steps needed to address the, them. I mean, the shock of climate change on the agriculture, that is nothing but the adaptation. Then what are the relevant policies and plans and processes we have in our hand at the moment to uh, increase the resilience of the climate, uh, agriculture sector for climate change shocks. And then how the stakeholder engagement could scale up 
to uh, contribute to climate action. And uh, to enlighten you about uh, what is the climate change, I think there's, there are some skepticism that the climate change is not a pact. But uh, I think now we all know that it is a really a pact. It is not a myth at all. Our ambient temperature is increasing slowly, but at consistent rate, at a rate of 0.01 to 0.03 degrees per year, especially the nighttime temperature. We have noticed during recent times with our research studies that night, cold nights have gone down and warm nights have gone up. That means nights are more warmer than those good old years. I think you all can experience it. And apart from that one, there will be more floods and more droughts and at very short arrival time with high intensity. I mean, their impacts are much more worse than those good years. And at the same time, the uh, intensity of rainfall, the amount of rainfall uh, receiving during a unit time is again has increased during recent time, especially during after 2005. And uh, as uh, Dr. Jatunga uh, mentioned today morning, the tornado type wind was not a scenario in Sri Lanka that we experienced in the climate ledge of Sri Lanka. But every year, especially during LA season, like uh, the, in the months uh, we are about to experience, there could be some tornado type winds, especially in the dry part of Sri Lanka. And intense lightning strikes, though the casualties of lightning strikes has gone down as a result of uh, comprehensive awareness program conducted by the Metropolis, but the lightning strikes have increased due recent, recent times despite the uh, low level of casualties. And also the, during recent times, we are experiencing some heat waves, especially uh, during uh, March, April, and also July, August, and sometimes it is a threat to the uh, he, uh, human health as well, not only to agriculture, human health as well. And again, sea level, even though the sea level rise is not yet a reality, but this, I mean, we, we, we will pose this threat as well in near future in a significant manner. Right, next. And again, the most important. Uh, uh, fact of our climate change in Sri Lanka, especially with respect to agriculture, is the seasonality of rainfall or rhythm of rainfall a season has been changed dramatically. That means there, there won't be rains when it is needed, but there will be more rains when it is not needed. That means more flood, more droughts. And that means in our own language, color has become a color. That is the real situation with respect to the rainfall regime and the changing and variable climate in Sri Lanka. Yes. Yes. And uh, I think we can skip this one. Yes. We can, yeah. So now we will uh, slowly move on to what are the impacts on agriculture and water resources through the climate change. And yeah. Okay, next. And the first and foremost impact on the agriculture from the uh, climate change is the reduced yield. This reduced yield can occur or can experience due to frequent and intense drought conditions and flood conditions with their short interval times and high temperature in stress and pest and disease uh, incidents. And for example, if you take this uh, graph, you will see that the uh, optimum temperature is around 25 or 40 synthesis in C3 plants. When you take the plant kingdom, there, there are two kinds of plants, C3 plants and C4 plants. C3 means the first uh, photosynthetic product is having a, a, a three carbon atoms and C4 means the first four synthetic product has four carbon atoms. So most of the plants uh, in the world are belongs to the 95% are uh, C3 plants and only 5% are C4 plants. And most of the crops ex, uh, are also C3 plants. In our agriculture, only the maize, sugarcane and sorghum are the uh, C4 plants and C4 plant has a capacity to withstand the high temperature and drought conditions. Therefore, most of our crops, including our staple rice, we are it belongs to the C3 plants. Therefore, the optimum temperature range of these C3 plants are for 18 to 24 degrees of centigrade for active photosynthesis. But you know that our temperature range in the special dry and intermediate zone, we are at the upper margin of the optimum range for photosynthesis uh, of uh, C3 plants. So per the increase, per the increase of uh, ambient temperature will definitely uh, surpass the uh, optimum uh, level of the 
uh, upper margin of the optimum level of the temperature and resulting subsequent yield reduction definitely. And the other uh, aspect of reducing yield is the reduced soil fertility. You know that with the increasing uh, temperature, ambient temperature, there will be more and more convectional rains like uh, so these um, in, these intense rains can make soil erosion uh, especially in the slow, uh, sloping lands even uh, in the even in the dry zone so that means the most fertile soil is washing away producing the uh, uh, land product with uh, uh, both uh, highlands and lowlands and the other one is with the increase in temperature especially in the drier part of the sri lanka there will be development of salinity in the soil which lowers the yield and sometimes uh, it may cause uh, cultivation is uh, beyond reality and the other one is with the increase in temperature you know that our soil are not rich in organic matter but soil organic matter is an essential component in soil for a better productivity but with increase in ambient temperature these organic matter are rapidly decomposing and therefore soil fertility goes down and also it's when, it, when it comes to fruit crop cultivation, if you think about the rambutan, uh, so to uh, power initiation in rambutan cultivation, especially in the Gampa district, WL3 agriculture, they, they need a dry spell of at least uh, um, uh, three weeks, very dry spell. So this dry spell comes in February normally. So if, but under climate change, sometime, even though it didn't happen this year, sometime even February become wet. And when it, uh, uh, it is raining in the January, so February, that required dry, dry spell is not met by the rambutan plant. So as a result, there won't be any rambutan fruit, fruiting uh, uh, or flowering in March, in the month of March, and no uh, rambutan fruits along the roadside in June. So this happened several uh, uh, two years back, three years back, fortunately last year and this year it does not happen. Therefore, you, you can uh, wait for a good uh, rambutan harvest this year. But remember, this is another uh, aspect of climate change that we have been experiencing in the past, even though it was not the reality this year. Okay, next. next uh, and uh, reduce quality of agricultural produce. So, for example, when you are having higher ambient temperature, the uh, it leads to the increased fiber content in the agricultural produce. It might be good for the diabetics, but normally when the fiber content goes up, the palatability goes down. So that means it is a, uh, one of the quality aspect is affected. Other one is the with the climate change, uh, we are experiencing heavy rain sometimes, especially during harvesting time when we don't need rains, but we are experiencing rains. So that will lead to the uh, heavy post-harvest losses and uh, at the expense of uh, quality of the product at sale. And also with the uh, increasing temperature under the changing climate, we are experiencing pest, more pests and diseases. That means uh, uh, the quality of the agricultural producers again goes down. Again, it is a vicious cycle actually. When we are having more and more pests and diseases, so farmers tend to apply more and more agrochemicals. So that means the quality and safety for products goes down as a result. And also with the uh, climate change, the, you know that the 80% of the uh, rural people are uh, depending on the uh, agriculture. So these communities, farming communities will subject to uh, uh, vector and goat, waterborne diseases under changing and uh, under changing and variable climate. So their workability their uh, efficiency will all those go, go down and also they will subject to malnutrition. This is like a, a vicious cycle again, poverty, livelihood, and uh, less resilient to the climate change uh, in these communities. Okay. And then if you think about the water resources, I think Mr. Hathur Singh touched upon uh, some of these things. So therefore, I am not going to explain how the watershed management should be done to uh, uh, improve the uh, water resource uh, potential of this country, but uh, with the climate change, there will be definitely reduced inflows to the reservoirs and, uh, and the tanks. Mm -hmm. So this means under drought condition, you might uh, experience very frequently that inflows are going down uh, so fast, especially with the uh, 
increase your transpiration rate and also there can be some damages to infrastructure especially irrigation infrastructure like as you see especially like region of dams region of canal network that means it affect the irrigation uh, base agriculture in the country next one. and also this uh, very uh, Serious situation, you know that we have around uh, 14,000 minor tanks, village tanks in the dry and intermediate zone of the country. And these tanks are uh, I mean, not uh, the deep tanks, they are shallow tanks. So shallow tanks means your spread is very high. That means with the increase in temperature during daytime, these tanks will dry out rapidly because no spread. Uh, as a result, uh, in a changing climate, you will experience more drying out tanks in the uh, dry and intermediate zones and resulting the, the low capacity to irrigate to their command area. So that means again, it's uh, leading to the drought distress, right? And again, when the uh, drought comes, when the inflows of the rivers uh, and streams goes down, then the, there will be a soul to the backflow from the uh, uh, river mouth to the indent uh, of the uh, rivers and streams. That means there will be salt water intrusions into the irrigation sources. And also this could happen even in the dug wells close to the coastal areas because of the shifting of the interface of the uh, interface between fresh water and uh, brackish water interface uh, shifting interior uh, to the, to the uh, uh, country and it will cause uh, water uh, quality dep uh, depletion, and especially with respect to the uh, salinity level. And also there will be a, a reduction of uh, water quality because of the uh, man-made activities. For example, when we, are, when, when we are doing agriculture, farmers always apply especially NNP fertilizers. So when, we, as I explained earlier, when we are having height intense rains, these uh, lands subject to soil erosion and ultimately these nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer come into the downstreams, especially the small reservoirs and large reservoirs, resulting eutrophication, which is a very serious threat to the water resources in this country, especially in the central highlands. And then what are the measures need to address them? As I said at the very outset, it's nothing but the adaptation measures. So then what are these adaptation measures? Uh, so we will uh, think about what are the possible adaptation measures in agriculture and water sectors. And uh, please go ahead. Yeah, next one. And so one of the foremost uh, tool we are having to increase the uh, uh, resilience or increase the adaptive capacity is to develop varieties that are resistant to biotic and abiotic stresses that are coming or that are arising from the climate change. For example, uh, high temperature tolerance varieties, pest and disease tolerant varieties, and saline tolerant varieties, and uh, uh, drought escaping varieties, shortage varieties. For example, now uh, the agriculture department has bred two and a half month variety like two, VG251 and LD261. Uh, two, uh, two these are two and a half month varieties. So they, if we face a drought or shorter season, then we can uh, go uh, proceed with the season by uh, solving these uh, shortage varieties. Likewise, the, there may be uh, several uh, varieties, not only in the rice, even in the other field crops, we have developed drought torrent varieties, heat torrent varieties, and uh, drought escape varieties. And, and right now, uh, there are some research going on to uh, develop uh, rice varieties that are tolerant to submergence. That means if the paddy field is subject to three to four days flooding still that varieties will survive and the other one is uh, uh, there are a lot of uncultivated lands due to several reasons i mean arable lands no, i I'm, I, I don't mean that uh, forest lands there are some arable lands which are not uh, cultivated for example if you go to the western province and uh, uh, especially the kalutara kalambu uh, and gampaha district we will see huge amount of uh, Abandoned paddy land, so these land somehow had to be have to bring to back into cultivation. Right now, there are, according to the, uh, the Department of Agrarian Development statistics, there are about forty-five thousand hectares of paddy lands that has been abandoned in the uh, wet zone of Sri Lanka, mainly Kalambu, Kalutara, uh, and Gul. 
and Gampaha. So this land has to be uh, bring back into the cultivation. And also uh, sometimes this, especially in the dry and intermediate zone, these some lands are Ladies, you know, all know this. Ladies, they are very small, so it's very difficult to mechanize. Their cost of cultivation goes uh, um, high, and also there is a labor issue. Therefore, there should be uh, some uh, initiatives or measures to consolidate land, so making big layer. The so we, then we can uh, go for mechanization easily while increasing the yield and while reducing the uh, cost of pro uh, production as well. Okay, next one. Then. Uh, another possible adaptation study is to pro uh, promote fertilizer efficient technologies because you know that around 70% of the fertilizer, especially nitrogen fertilizer, we are applying to the soil are uh, lost to the atmosphere. It is again the serious mitigation issue. So therefore, we are encouraging to go for integrated uh, plant nutrient system. That's something like we always. Uh, I'm not trying to say that go for organic, 100% organic, but there will be a, a judicial combination of uh, combined inorganic fertilizers and organic fertilizers. Thereby, we can increase the plant uh, crop product production while uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emission to the uh, atmosphere. And also, we can think about the nano fertilizers. We are right now we are uh, working on it, and also rather than blanket recommendation for the entire country now we are work uh, we have developed the uh, site specific fertilizer recommendations like something like uh, under uh, gn level uh, wise now earlier we had uh, ds level wise now we have further uh, improved it um, to gn level wise therefore we can reduce the fertilizer in some areas for example earlier every year every season we add phosphorus fertilizers to the uh, paddy fields but now the new recommendation is apply phosphorus per fertilizer uh, triple super phosphate every other season so that means we can cut, we have cut down the uh, phosphorus fertilizer by 50 percent even right now so these are some good adaptation strategies and again uh, promote crop diversification and intercropping you know that when we are having a monocrop when there's a drought or flood, that then the entire crop will go. But if you have a combination of crops, some of these crops might be tolerant or uh, persistent for these uh, biotic or abiotic stresses. Therefore, still we can have some kind of yield rather than the complete loss. Therefore, pro crop diversification and intercropping is highly advantageous under changing and variable climate. Right, next one. And again, integrated pest management. Actually, we always uh, earlier in go, go nears we use huge amount of uh, pesticide in this country. And uh, uh, but it is not the case right now. Sometimes even in rice fields, uh, some some farmers they don't even apply even a drop of pesticide because now uh, we have we have had a very comprehensive program on uh, integrated pest management approach. And so it is highly taken by the farmers because it, it is environmental friendly, cost effective, and also yield are also high. So therefore, you will see that when you go along the uh, road in some paddy fields, you will see that some uh, uh, like this, uh, what is called this, polar atwal kali hitavalatino. Ah, they have put this uh, uh, coconut uh, leaves branches. So to attract uh, what's called the birds. So the birds will stay, uh, sit on there and then they will pick the uh, pest from the paddy field. So they are, by, they are reducing the uh, pest population. So this is this has been proven technique, not only in Sri Lanka, area since 1980, uh, uh, especially in the rice cultivation, uh, IPM. Right, next one. And Promote home garden. It's another that we have found that with the uh, study we conducted uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, India, that the role of uh, home garden in food security under changing and variable climate, we have found that in all three countries, home gardening is a very good candidate or tool we are having uh, our hand uh, to increase the uh, household food security under changing climate because sometimes it may be additional household income. But rather than additional income, it will ensure the household food security, especially when the disaster hits. So, for example, during this COVID time, you know that all uh, uh, communities from the 
very top uh, level to uh, even up to the uh, uh, labors so they used to cultivate uh, the, uh, in their home garden uh, maybe on rice bags uh, they are vegetables and uh, green uh, green chilies so yeah, that was a very good move that was a blessing in disguise which came to effect with the covid 19 now more in old homes you can see at least three or four uh, green uh, chili plants are growing in rice bags so this is a home garden so this has to be a, a further strengthened uh, to increase the uh, household uh, resilience for climate change with respect to the food security and also storage and packing i mean we can most of the uh, farm producers are primary produce so they will go to the market without the do any uh, value addition or processing therefore the, the price they are pitching is very much lower therefore we can encourage with uh, uh, required advices and technical guidance storage and packing so th that they can produce not as a primary product they can pr uh, sell it as a value added product so that they can fetch a higher price for their farm producers and it's good for cus uh, uh, customers as well and uh, another uh, aspect of uh, sri lankan agriculture is the there are about 35 40% loss of uh, perishable as per sawas losses from farm gate to the consumer so this has to be stopped at any cost so so there will be uh, a lot of efforts in uh, years to come uh, to stop this uh, loss of uh, valuable resources as per sawas losses now right now we had the more, uh, process of uh, developing the national agriculture policy of sri lanka we have uh, we, uh, already uh, come up with the 15 policy statement and one policy statement is com uh, completely have focus on the, uh, the reducing the post sars losses and i am also happy to say that another policy is statement is complete focus on the building climate resilience in the agriculture in sri lanka so okay the next one okay then the vertical farming you can uh, use this kind of uh, structures uh, as you might have witnessed even in colombo areas so this uh, vertical is uh, farming so it, you can produce a lot more in a very small space by using the uh, uh, vertical structures than the uh, urban agriculture rooftop gardening we are uh, we have uh, make some poli ex policy actions in the national agriculture policy, even uh, giving a very high emphasis on the urban agriculture or rooftop gardening in Sri Lanka to, as a uh, measure of climate change resilience and also improving the national food security as well. Okay, next step, please. And the another aspect which is very important, especially under very uh, changing and variable climate, is the plants or crops are highly vulnerable to with uh, shocks of climate if the uh, planting material or seeds that they are using are not quality that means they have to be certified seed for the vigor and germination and everything so therefore they need to have a very comprehensive program to promote uh, or produce uh, quality seed and planting material for example right now in the uh, uh, in paddy sector we are using only 10% of the uh, seed paddy produced by the government, farms and the private sector. 90% of the seed paddy of the Sri Lanka are produced by farmers themselves. So normally uh, uh, one rice variety, if the seed paddy uh, is produced after four seasons, that quality goes down. Therefore, it has to be uh, reintroduced new uh, stocks, uh, seed stock every fourth year. So, but that is not happening in Sri Lanka right now. So, we have to break this cycle if we want to increase the productivity under the changing and variable climates, right? And then the previous the concept of, concept of integrated farming. If you think about the agriculture in the dry zone and intermediate zone in good goal, good goal, uh, good old years, the livestock was in, an integral part of the uh, community, both crop-based agriculture and along with the one of dairy cattle or uh, at least uh, uh, poultry but this has become uh, now not uh, very common especially in the dry zone maybe due to several reasons maybe some religious issues or cultural issues but when they are when we are having this integration 
So that system is highly uh, resilient. For example, if the two or three season goes worse, at least they can sell their stocks and have some income for their day-to-day -day living. That's what they were doing during good old years. So that, that was uh, insurance for the uh, kind of uh, annual cropping farmers. And the, having uh, livestock in their position was insurance for them, especially under the uh, worst uh, years of climate. And also, we can look for livestock family business. I mean, you can have a dairy, then you can uh, can produce dairy products like curd, then it, it can become a family business with good prosperity. Right? OK, then other one is the uh, cultivation of crop based on the agroecological regions. You all know that we have 46, agro, 46 agroecological regions in this country. and uh, each are having a, a unique uh, edaphic feeders, I mean, soils and climate. So one agroecological uh, region might not be suitable for some crop, but it, it, that particular agroecological region might be very suitable for some other crops. So if we are growing crops which find their best expression in the soil and climate wise, so then they are less vulnerable to climate shocks. That means they are more resilient. Therefore, rather than just go and plant some crops and uh, then uh, subject to uh, loss and damage, uh, then the, it is not the case. For example, if you go and plant coconut in the Hambantara region, DL5, the uh, driest part of the region, so it's no, no, no doubt it will subject to doubt, injury. So then we should not go and plant uh, coconut in the Hambantara and then claim, oh, okay, we have uh, our coconut cultivation have been struck by doubt. It's not a way we should do. So there are rare crops which can be grown in the, that particular area. So then we should go for those crops, not for the unsuitable crops for that particular agroecological environment. So as a result, and uh, we have uh, shown that, we have found that if you follow the agroecological recommendation, uh, I mean, crops uh, suitability, then that particular system are uh, highly resilient for climate shocks. And uh, then I uh, told you that both uh, agriculture and water goes in hand, uh, especially the uh, uh, crops needs water. Therefore, we should have some adaptation strategies, uh, water sector as well. And therefore, we have to uh, uh, use uh, water efficient farming techniques because um, right now, more than 80% of the water of Sri Lanka is used for agriculture, but we can't uh, entertain this kind of uh, custom, uh, uh, high water usage uh, in the agriculture sector because in the future we have to think about the uh, industry sector, uh, service sector and other environmental issues. Therefore, we can't uh, entertain this kind of uh, luxury consumption of water in the agriculture sector. Therefore, definitely we have to move to the more efficient uh, irrigation uh, techniques like uh, micro irrigation, drip irrigation, uh, sprinkler irrigation, rain guns, this kind of, there are a lot of uh, uh, modalities uh, we can uh, use in the field to uh, increase the water use efficiency in the uh, farm field. So it is a very good adaptation for climate change as well, because you know that with climate change, the availability of water resources is going down. Therefore, we are compelled to use uh, efficient irrigation water techniques. And then renovation of maintenance and existing tank and canal works, because uh, I told at the beginning, there are 14,000 minor tanks working in the country, especially in the with dry zone and intermediate zone. There are more, uh, about 6,000 another minor tanks which have been abandoned due to several reasons. So if we can bring these tanks into operation with appropriate intervention, that will be a very good adaptation strategy. And also their canal network as well. And rain or harvesting, of course, uh, this is a very prudent technology, not only in Sri Lanka, everywhere in the world, uh, especially when water limiting areas like uh, dry zone. So we can have on, on farm water uh, harvesting devices like uh, the pataha, we call uh, uh, commonly called this pataha. And then we can collect uh, rainwater. And uh, if there are some uh, percolation issues, if the soil is more uh, pliable, if the soil is more porous, then we can line in this one. There are now the, there are uh, uh, polythenes. Uh, especially made for this kind of lighting in this uh, 
rainwater harvesting systems. Therefore, we can uh, collect the rainwater during the rainy season and uh, use the uh, during the dry season, dry season with uh, pumping facilities. And now uh, farmers are using even solar power to pump these collected water in rainwater collecting devices in their uh, farmlands in the dry and intermediate zone. It's a very good uh, strategy that we have adapted. And also roof rain, water harvesting, you might have clearly seen this one. Uh, it, this is common even in the wet zone where the uh, water is limiting, especially in the hilly areas. So uh, we can make use of the roof water harvesting for even for uh, potable users as well. The next time. And uh, this is again a rehabilitation of abandoned tank. Then uh, adapt integrated water resource management concept. This is again well-known concept, well proven technology. That means rather than we are working alone, agriculture or irrigation sector alone, we will take all the stakeholders of the water sector uh, together and uh, do planning. And then as a result, we can make, uh, increase the water productivity. So that means uh, each sector will be benefited if you uh, adapt the integrated water resource management concept, not only the, uh, the uh, supply side, demand side as well and also uh, it, it is considered it is focused uh, uh, even in the uh, watershed management when you think about the integrated water source management and also the other important point is to reduce the point and non-point source pollution because uh, we know that most of the water resources are polluted now maybe uh, due, due to unknown reason uh, maybe due to uh, have, have hazard disposal of waste and also sometimes due to the uh, excessive use of fertilizer, that is the non-point source of pollution, and uh, sometimes it is waste. So uh, we have our water resources are limited, so we have to uh, maintain the quality of our water, not only for agriculture, even for drinking, so that we can increase the resilience of the uh, agriculture and the household sector for climate change. Right, next time. Dr. Punya uh, yeah. sorry to step in. This is a really great presentation. I'm, I'm learning quite a bit, but just to let you know that we are at 11.45. And we yeah, also... I'm going to stop. Okay, thank okay, then on top of all these things, we are at, uh, we are advising our farmers to go for climate smart agriculture. Now we have already developed national guidelines for climate smart agriculture. So that, that will be uh, published very soon. And so when we apply as climate smart agriculture, we are definitely increasing the resilience of the agriculture sector. Okay, next slide. I think uh, this section of relevant policies and plans, this was uh, discussed by the Dr. Jayatungu today morning about the national climate change policy, then the national adaptation plan, then the NDC. So these are the policies and plans we are having in our hand. So then we, we can skip this one. It was discussed by Dr. And uh, as I mentioned, we have a national guideline on climate smart agriculture in our hand. So that's a very good uh, document to write next time. And I think... Uh, NDCs, other one is the NDC that was also discussed by, I think, Nelbini and also Dr. Jayatunga, so therefore uh, we don't need to discuss uh, as time is uh, fast. The other one is how uh, we uh, can uh, upscale this stakeholder uh, engagement. So for this one, we have to identify who are the stakeholders in the agriculture sector. It might be state sector, private sector, and civil society. I think Dr. Jatunga, he also mentioned about this. We have, first we have to, next slide, first we have to identify these sectors, uh, state sector, private sector, and civil societies. Then we have, have to collect information about the climate change and what are the adaptation strategies we have. Then we can have a dialogue between every stakeholders. Then we can go for further step ahead. Then we can go for consultation to have a concrete solutions and then have collaborative project. And finally, we can have, we can institutionalize these projects. And as then as a result, we can upscale this climate action. You will see that with this uh, graph, with the involvement of the stakeholders are getting higher and higher, the influence or the uh, efficiency or impact of the climate action will be higher and higher. If you need more information about this one, you can uh, use this web page. So it, it is a very uh, comprehensive document about this stakeholder engagement in climate action. I think uh, that concludes my uh, brief presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Punyavardhana.
Um, so we will now move on to the question and answer sessions uh, that we have for the speakers. And I would kind of like, like to request the speakers who are with us to maybe turn on their um, video. So, um, and in the meantime, we would also like to request all those in the audience who had questions for the speakers and to anyone who's joined us from Facebook. If you have any uh, questions specific to the speakers, uh, kindly do drop them in the chat or the Q&A as well. Um, so maybe just uh, if we can first start off with, uh, with I think Dr. Prathaviraj has uh, also commitment. So uh, maybe just a question to you uh, first, uh, Dr. Prathaviraj. So you spoke in uh, relation, particularly uh, to human and any, sorry human animal conflict and biodiversity. So when we and earlier when we had the Mentimeter, we had a lot of uh, people identify as CSOs, and we had a few from private sector. So what do you think their role in particular is when it comes to uh, these two aspects, especially in the context of say stakeholder engagement? I think um, the main issue with human wildlife conflict and particularly human elephant conflict is identifying the proper stakeholders. So the point is when we, the human, what we mean by human wildlife conflict is basically damage to crops and maybe some property. So that happens at a individual level, a individual farmer or individual villager is affected. So clearly they have to be the main stakeholders in preventing this and mitigating this issue. And since this is basically a problem that people have, the agencies responsible for people's welfare, whether it's government or non-government, should be the main stakeholders in helping these people overcome this issue. So I think that that is the main change that needs to happen because currently human wildlife conflict is viewed as a conservation problem and the conservation agencies are tasked with mitigating this problem. That hasn't worked and that will not work. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Prathviraj. There is also um, a question from Damita uh, specific to you. So what is the role CSOs, can, uh, CSOs play in taking the scientific methodology you mentioned into uh, a more local level? I think here the main action has to be done by the government. So actually there needs to be policy level um, decisions taken and leadership given to this kind of changing of paradigm in addressing human wildlife conflict. And so unless that happens, I think uh, the other uh, stakeholders uh, cannot really do a lot. So I think what everybody can do is try to convince the government that uh, this needs to be done. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prathviraj, uh, for your comments and also for joining us. I would now like to um, maybe uh, we have a board, uh, we have what we call a Myro board setup, which is like a virtual whiteboard. It will be shared shortly. And there are three questions there that we would like to uh, request our speakers to also try and help us. Uh, I think it will be shared uh, in a minute. So there are three questions on it that we would like the speakers to help us, and also as, with, as well as with input from the audience. But apart from that, we have some questions already uh, that have been uh, dropped on the chat as well as Q&A. Uh, there's no Q&A, sorry, just on the chat. So um, maybe just to keep two things in mind. So if we could um, answer first the questions on the Myro board, or as well as uh, we simultaneously have questions going on for the speakers. I hope that was clear. So uh, there's one question from Varuni. So we see collaborations from time to time on certain projects, be it related to increasing mangrove forest cover, mitigating human and human conflict, uh, post-disaster response and recovery activities. But is there a framework at present to link sectors specifically working on climate, agriculture, biodiversity, forestry and related fields? And from what you understand, do existing policies and regulations with organizations that encourage and facilitate collaboration uh, between the government, private sector and CSOs, and also collaborations between department and ministries within the government? 
Uh, the question is on the chat. Um, I would like to maybe request each speaker if, if it's possible for them to respond to this within 30 seconds. So, uh, um, maybe we could uh, start off with Mr. Satra Singh, if you are... Uh, okay. Collaboration from time to time on certain projects, uh, be it related to increasing mangrove forest cover. Yeah, is that the question? I think this is the question, right? The question is, uh, we see collaboration from time to time on certain projects, be it uh, related to the increase in mango forest cover, mitigating human animal conflict, post disaster response and recovery activities, etc. But is there a framework at uh, present to link sectors specifically uh, working on climate, agriculture, biodiversity, forestry and related fields? And from what do you understand, do the existing policies and regulations within organization encourage and facilitate collaborations between the government? private sector and CSOs, and also collaborations between departments, ministries within the government. Yes, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, now if I take the forestry sector, forestry policy, national forestry policy, it uh, talks, there's a separate even statements and section on uh, stakeholder participation. But uh, when it goes to the practice, um, there are certain limitations, I said, even, uh, so that is why even like uh, in the case of, now, for example, uh, so when we were trying to get the community participation in uh, uh, reforestation and the natural forest management, there are problems in uh, sharing benefits because I mean, it is really needed uh, at the grassroots level to share some benefits of the forest, I mean, the forest products once they are involved in uh, promoting uh, the forestry, then of course they, they are sort of a need to share the benefits. So, so that sort of uh, barriers are there. Now, even with the uh, private sector, so for example, if we are talking about uh, the sharing uh, benefits of nature-based tourism with private sector, there are certain, uh, I mean, the legal uh, barriers. So, I mean, Whatever the policy says, but of course at the ground level, there are certain barriers. So, uh, so these needed to be addressed and uh, come over. Otherwise, uh, like I mean, we talk about a lot of stakeholder participations, but they are limited. I mean, um, to have it formal, there are restrictions. But most of the policies they talk about. Uh, stakeholder, I mean, promoting communities, promoting private sector participation and various other things. But uh, in reality, there are certain barriers to be overcome. And also what even I mentioned in my, my presentation, this uh, communication yeah, and uh, sort of uh, intermutual uh, uh, mutual uh, understanding between the private sector and the state sector. There's a gap or the barrier. So uh, I'm looking at each other, they still have the mistrust. So the, those are, the, so the communication could done a lot there. So, I mean, uh, from my uh, point of view, I see those are the barriers, but of course we need, I mean, we need to work uh, as one stakeholder, I mean, especially the national issues like uh, the climate change, where all other sectors are involved. So. We need to overcome these uh, barriers and uh, work together. Thank you. I think uh, at least uh, I had some uh, this thing answer yes. uh, some points uh, to answer uh, Barone's question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadhu Singh. Um, uh, Ms. Rana Singh, would you be able to uh, comment on this uh, with regard to the uh, mangrove aspect? Um, maybe until Ms. Rana Singh comes back. Go on to be able to reach her. Maybe uh, I would like to uh, speak talk to Dr. Punya Vartana. Um, Dr. Punya Vartana, would you be able to maybe um, explain a bit on how universities could contribute to climate action uh, very briefly? Yeah, university, actually, we should not uh, think university as a uh, 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 in isolation, we should not uh, work in isolation uh, because uh, university academia they are generating the uh, technology, 
and uh, not only the agriculture research, research institutes even the research, research conducted by the universities are very much important for increasing the climate resilient and uh, so they should uh, always uh, work hand in hand with the government and private sector institution to develop the technology uh, which may act as climate action and also uh, they have a, a huge uh, human resource and uh, they can be i mean student body so they can be take as messengers uh, to take the uh, 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 any new uh, ideas or any new uh, concept about uh, increasing the climate resilient to their home so, so you can imagine around 20000 uh, university student in this country every year. so if one student go and uh, talk with their parents so that there will be a good dissemination modality so they should be on board when we talk about the climate actions uh thank you very much uh, dr punyavaratana for your uh remarks i would now like to maybe quickly um, move to dr kustu gopalpala our um who is also on the call dr kustu gopalpala is a senior consultant here like in trust uh, and specializing in climate change and sustainable development dr kustu gopalpala Uh, yeah thank you uh, yes right so, yeah yeah maybe you have you a particular question or is a general yeah, one uh, maybe if you could just uh, very briefly explain on how uh, the sdgs connect to these areas that you're focusing on right yes yeah uh, basically like we look at the climate action it's like is part of sdgs for sdg 13 so on that and, uh, but then of course when you look at the sdgs uh, one of the key challenge for achieving achieve sdgs is also climate in issue so so they have is basically part of sdgs but uh, we see uh, uh, the required level of you know this uh, harmonization of these activities uh, in in uh, ground level is not there so therefore we are not probably uh, uh, use this uh, opportunity to uh, mainstream climate action uh, uh, by, by looking at the sdg aspect so therefore i think uh, even even for stakeholder consultation that's a key Uh, that uh, now we are having this uh, localization of sdgs uh, for which i think stakeholders uh, should contribute so my uh, overall uh, opinion is basically that uh, we can use sdgs for mainstream in uh, climate action too because uh, uh, for example the uh, decision makers will be more reactive to uh, issues related to uh, in development uh, than you know environment so so therefore we can uh, effectively use this opportunity Uh, uh having sdgs been uh, localized now to see how to harmonize it and then what are the opportunities for stakeholder consultation so so in that context uh, uh, not only sdg you know uh, localization but uh, there are other you know uh, national level uh, you know uh, policies and action plans being revised so already we discussed on uh, ndcs uh, though uh, this cycle of ndcs is uh, already uh, just about to complete Uh, the ndc uh, this uh, national determined contribution uh, this updating will be a continuum process so that we need more uh, stakeholder consultation they are for climate action and ndc is uh, so i think uh, even this uh, round of ndc we have not seen uh, much of uh, you know this stakeholder consultation uh, due to maybe uh, short time you know agency and so on but then uh, we can't allow that to happen in the future so therefore uh, so this one area the ndc is uh, updating uh, that will happen in the future too so we have to see how uh, we can effectively use uh, you know uh, the uh, stakeholders csos uh, be engaged with this process then of course localization of ndc is uh, sdg is happening now uh, through sustainable development council uh, so they are going uh, now uh, in uh, the central government level but there are plans to go for local governments that's also very important you know the stakeholder then go into the other stakeholders so therefore uh, the uh, the localization of uh, localization of sdgs uh, uh, you know we can uh, look at uh, the, uh, the opportunities for stakeholder consultations or stakeholder engagement where there is a uh, component in uh, you know climate action too but uh, more importantly it's not just isolated you know sdg these are integrated and uh, we can uh, look at the common you know features uh, that uh, we can uh, use the opportunity created by sdgs uh, to mainstream you know climate action so 
uh, and and uh, so some of the entry points also uh, with the recent uh, you know uh, some uh, initiatives uh, you are aware that now national uh, uh, environment policy been updated uh, so that's just started so that is one of the i think key entry point uh, for uh, the stakeholders to go into even climate actions uh, and beyond that too then secondly uh, there's another activity going on there's a national environment action plan which been now finalized uh, uh, there to uh, the uh, the uh, this climate action is there as one of the theme but then uh, of course uh, these also cross cutting areas are there like uh, you know this forestry biodiversity agriculture all are highlighted uh, so so that uh, we can see how uh, these uh, action uh, plans policies are integrated are connected with sdgs and ndcs and 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 have a kind of a, a common uh, uh, you know methodology to uh, to to approach these so so therefore i think there are entry points now uh, for stakeholder consultation so that uh, we can uh, mainstream uh, you know ndc actions uh, uh, or, or rather uh, the climate action or ndcs uh, and with sdgs so so i think uh, this uh, this sdg and ndc harmonization and finding uh, opportunity to collaborate uh, or, or you know resource uh, you know usage like or, or, or those aspect will be very important that's basically my overall uh, you know comment on that thank you thank you very much dr sudakapala um i would now like to move quickly move on to the myro board um i believe uh, dennis has shared a link to this on the chat So just to let you know how this works, it is a virtual whiteboard. So when you click on this link, it will take you to the screen that you're seeing, and you're able to uh, drop a sticky note. So if you just so yeah, it's been demonstrated as we look. So you can just select, you can drop a sticky note and uh, add your input there. This is really great if you don't want to unmute yourself and speak, and or if you don't want to use this, you could also uh, drop your input on the chat, and one of our team members will. Uh, take it to the myro board if you are doing that however kindly do say which question you are answering so um we'll be able to uh, put it in the appropriate board um so now i for the speakers who are still with us and i know we are slightly over time but i would like to request everyone on the call to maybe stay on for about 5 minutes more so we could get some input the presentations are fantastic and we didn't want to stop anyone uh because it was uh, a lot that we were learning So I would like to maybe move to the last, uh, well, the, the third question rather, since since that has the least amount of input, and I would like to kind of request the speakers who are on the call to provide their input um, to this answer this, as well as to anyone else on in the audience who are willing to share their insight on it. So, how can multi-stakeholder engagement be integrated into policies? Uh, climate commitment, sustainable development, and COVID nineteen. Uh, sorry, and adjust COVID nineteen recovery. So, uh, Miss Ramasinghe, are you back on the call with us? Okay, maybe not. So maybe um, I would like to request uh, maybe Dr. Sonia Varadkar and Miss Sakshi Singhha, um, um, Dr. Sugata Kala. anyone and anyone else who's on the call if you would like please raise your hand or you could also unmute yourself and uh, speak or drop your uh, comments on the chat so if dr punya varth would you uh, would you like to uh, uh, help us with this uh, question on uh, the, this is the third one on the board the one which one uh, how can multi stakeholder engagement be integrated into policies climate commitment sustainable development uh, in yes. in which in which box the first box or second box the third box third box yes third box okay. so um, any input that you give how, uh, how yes. can how can multi stakeholder and then be integrated in the policies climate committee sustainable uh if you think about uh, agriculture sector i think it's the already multi stakeholder engagement is there uh, that problem is uh, there are no coordination that is one of the problem because sometimes the private sector doesn't know what the uh, the government sector does and uh, university doesn't know sometimes uh, what are the uh, anticipation of the agriculture department in terms of the technology generation and so this kind of uh, 
problems uh, is existing in our system, not only today, even from the past. And I, am, uh, I hope that it will be there for another couple of years. So if we want to break this uh, cycle, I think there should be some kind of uh, coordination, especially uh, with respect to technology generation uh, by an apex body so that there won't be duplication or replication of information generation. And then it will ensure the delivery of the most wanted outcomes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Satra Singha. Uh, Mr. Satra Singha, are you still on the call with us? Right. Uh, Mr. Satra Singha, I see you're yes. unmuted. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I had a small discussion in there. No, uh, that, that, that's all right, Mr. Satra Singha. So I uh, just let you know what's um, happening right now. So we have this my robot that you can see on your screen that we've uh, set up. So if you could maybe just go through that, Mr. Satra Singha is also here. Uh, we are trying to uh, gather responses to these three different questions that we have. Uh, Mr. Satra Singh, I'm wondering, would you be able to comment on the third uh, question? That is on how can multi question again, yeah, in this COVID situation, I think even in forestry sector, like uh, uh, we are trying to work with the private sector and the communities in nature-based tourism promotion. And then when it comes to the restoration, we also try to work with private sector as well as uh, the, the communities, rural communities. So um, again, uh, now, for example, most of the activities are being like uh, in standard uh, state with some, you know, uh, for example, uh, the community fencing program in my project, the World Bank project. Uh, this has been affected largely uh, by this COVID-19 situation because we cannot go to the villages. And, uh, since people are going outside to the, their districts and villages, there are restrictions. Uh, for us to go and conduct training programs and awareness programs to uh, get their, um, I mean, get their willingness to participate in uh, this type of activities. So this is uh, one thing. So in addition to that, even uh, the like, uh, I mean, we always look at I mean, the forestry is linked to the communities, uh, generating different uh, livelihood programs uh, uh, through uh, management of national uh, resources. So they are again, uh, like one of the major uh, constraint or the problem we have faced is to have the connections, to develop the connections uh, through various awareness programs and trainings. So that has been affected. And also, uh, as even in my uh, presentation, we uh, um, discuss uh, the gender issues and various uh, type of other, even lack of, uh, loss of, job opportunities in various uh, sectors due to non-functioning. So this is also something to be considered uh, when we are talking about the multi-stakeholder participation in a situation like uh, COVID-19 recovery. So we need, I mean, since this is sort of, sort of a new thing, uh, which has shocked the entire community, I think we need to look at, uh, I mean, we have to learn from the COVID situation and try to uh, identify new policies or the statements to be incorporated into uh, the ongoing policies, I suppose. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Satra Singha. Uh, Ms. Rana Singha, I'm wondering if you were able to. Ms. Rana Singha? Um, okay, uh, Dr. Sugatapada, I'm wondering, would you be also able to uh, comment on this? Um, yeah, just to build on uh, what already said by uh, Dr. Punyawadhan and uh, Mr. Hathra Singh, uh, I think this, uh, especially under the COVID situation, uh, we are able to test the uh, governance and also the stakeholders' involvement in, uh, you know, the uh, this type of a situation. So it's, uh, I think, uh, learning curve for us. And what we have seen is uh, uh, the, uh, the we had to redefine the stakeholders and their role through the learnings we had, for example, uh, uh, just one example is this uh, supply chain. So we had seen a breakdown in supply chain, then how uh, the local uh, level 
decentralized supply chains evolve with uh, different you know stakeholder engagement so uh, this is just one example so i think uh, this covid situation has given us uh, 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 learning or exercise to redefine the stakeholders and their uh, role in a broader context uh, within uh, you know these pillar challenges so so especially at the agriculture forestry livelihood you know those uh, even biodiversity areas uh, where we can now uh, look uh, in more i think uh, rigorous way uh, to see how we can uh, really mobilize uh, stakeholders to achieve this uh, uh, the targets so i think i see it as a positive thing i think uh, but then uh, important thing is uh, the stakeholder consultation would be a key their engagement would be key in most of the uh, the, the challenges so that's basically kind of an overall uh, comment from my side thank you thank you very much uh, dr sumitapala uh, ms rana singh would you be yes. able to yes is after this covid situation actually we have realized the values of biodiversity especially the traditional medicinal practice medicine and traditional practices uh, which we have used to get cure of this uh, situation and traditional food habits and uh, agricultural practices came uh, like everybody discussed the value of those things so we had a, a nice opportunity to take the values of biodiversity into uh, uh, action i mean uh, to take it to stakeholders and to uh, understand the values and the conservation priorities to identify so like it's a, i think it's a very good opportunity and at the moment we are in the process of preparation of national environmental action plan Uh, while preparing this action plan we had a stakeholder consultation very deep stakeholder consultation with all the relevant stakeholders including private sector uh, cbos ngos and government non governmental all the stakeholders we have consulted so like uh, getting all the ideas we we will be able to have a practical and implementable a national environmental action plan which can be implemented in the ground level up to to uh, 2030 so that is the process which is yeah. carried out right now in the uh, ministry so yeah. i think uh, stakeholder engagement uh, is very much valuable and we can use that uh, ideas to develop this uh, environmental action plan thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Anasinghe, and um, thank you very much to all of the speakers who joined us today and for giving us their time, and especially for the speakers as well as the rest of the participants who stayed on uh, for a bit longer despite uh, going over time. Uh, we really value your time. Um, so just to let you let everyone know, uh, with this we will be concluding the uh, dialogue for today. and uh, the miro board will remain open the link is on the chat if you did want to um, say something and couldn't be very sorry about that uh, however you are able to drop in any uh, comments that you would want or any input that you would want into this as well and also apologize apologies to everyone who had submitted questions and uh, the ones that we couldn't take so uh, with that i would like to uh, conclude the webinar for today but before that i would also like to invite those on the call and share share my screen um those on the call to join us for uh another national dialogue on youth engagement in climate action biodiversity forestry and agriculture in sri lanka that's happening this friday i believe from 6 to 8 pm um so please do share the word we would like to um have your input we'd like for you all to be a part of this and if you would like to get have uh, be informed of our events can we do drop your email address on the chat and we'll be happy to send you uh, the login details for this as well so with that i'd like to conclude and bring this session to a close so thank you very much to all those who joined and um, thank you for being a part of it thank you to everyone on facebook until um until we see you all next time uh, that's goodbye from us